Ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls, thank you for joining me once again today, and welcome to Dominions 5, Warriors of the Faith. Now, Dominions is one of these games that I really, really enjoy, and I've sunk a huge amount of time in. Fair warning, you might not like this series. Uh, this is a slow-paced, turn-based, wide-scale strategy game that not everyone enjoys, and it's extremely complicated. In, in many ways, Dominions is the dwarf fortress of strategy games. So, uh, if you're not interested in that kind of thing, if you just want the Warhammer content or some of the more fast-paced stuff, stick around, there'll be more of that. But, as I said, I really, really love this series of games, and I sunk a lot of time into Dominions 3 and Dominions 4. Uh, and so I picked this up as soon as it went on sale earlier this week, and I just have to play it. I've got I've to show it off to you. So, in Dominions, the basic premise of the game is you are a god, a pretender god, who is trying to rule the world after the previous all-omnipotent deity vanished, and you are battling other gods in order to take the place over and reshape the world in your own image and the image of your nation. And so you choose a nation, you lead that nation down through the years, and you command it and reshape the world and take things over and spread your religion and it's all great fun uh, and it's all extremely complex there is a very large and complex magic system there's summoning spells there's battle spells there's rituals you can perform that affect other people's areas um, you can recruit different units entirely different units depending on what your nation is uh, you can discover magical sites that give you magical gems that you use to power rituals it it, it spirals out of control very very quickly so this series, uh, first off, disclaimer, I am not terribly good at this game. I've probably spent four or five hundred hours playing Dominions, between Dominions 3 and Dominions 4, and I am still, I would say, let's say, not a top-level player. I, I, I've never won a multiplayer game of Dominions. Dominions can be played over email. Uh, and it commonly is, and those games last for months, and they become extremely competitive. And I have never even come close to finishing one of those games. But playing single player is a very different experience, and that's what we're going to do, just to kind of show the game off. So, first we create the world. Uh, in Dominions 5, the random map generation feature has really been improved, so we're going to create a random map. We'll go medium side size. I'm going to disable wraparound, because I like the just the square maps better. So there will be edges to this map. Uh, game name will be Let's Play. Only normal file games can be used. Oh, come on. There we go. We're going to start on the early ages. So this is one of the, the first interesting and complicated parts of Dominion. Uh, you see, so I chose the early ages. You notice there were three options, early, middle, and late. These are all the factions available in the early ages. Here are all the factions available in the Middle Ages. And here are the factions available in the Late Ages. Every one of these factions is completely different from each other. Completely different in what magic they have access to, completely different in what units they have access to. Now you may notice a lot of the names are the same. Tian Shi shows up in Early, Middle, and Late. So does Arcosophale. Uh, so does Sitis. So does Abyssia. So does Agartha. A bunch of these do. And many of the other names uh, are related, and that's because in Dominions, Dominions has a storyline of how uh, the ages have progressed and how the nations have advanced. So in the early age, Tianxi in the spring and autumn period is an early, um, an early Chinese nation with masters of the five elements, elemental wizards, the celestial masters who practice astral magic as well as water magic and a bunch of others. Uh, they've got noble chariots. They've got the very start of sort of an imperial Chinese civilization. Then in the middle age, uh, the Tianxi has been taken over by the Imperial Bureaucracy, where they have very versatile mages, they have geomancers who practice earth magic, they have alchemists who can easily turn magical gems into gold, they have very high-level cavalry, very powerful cavalry, they can summon sacred celestial beings, and they have these administrator units, so they're very different, although they maintain a lot of the same strengths. And then, in the Late Ages, uh, Tianxi still exists, but it has been taken over by uh, barbarians. And so now they use death magic. They worship ancestors. They have death and I think earth and some astral magic. Uh, they have priest mages, sacred mages, instead of imperial bureaucrats. 
Uh, they have the Ancestor Cult instead of the Bureaucracy. So it's a very different faction, although still recognizably similar and derived from the earlier factions. You have these giant factions that proceed down through the ages until you reach Gath, uh, you know, starting off with Hinnom and on to Ashdod and then to Gath. So it's very, very, uh, it's very complex, and it, there's a lot of backstory and legends behind it. And many of these factions, most of them even, are derived from real-world mythology and real-world history, uh, sort of blended together with high fantasy tropes. So we are going to play in the early ages. I'm going to put in four players, three other AIs, which I'm, uh, I'm probably going to leave on normal. Eh, maybe I'll make him difficult. I'll make him difficult. Just what the heck. I might lose this, but who cares? And I am going to play as Fomoria, the Cursed Ones. So Fomoria is a bountiful land inhabited by malformed giants. The land was attacked by wave after wave of invaders. Of these, the Firbolg, lesser descendants of the Nemedians, have established themselves and live in peace with the Fomorians. A few of the magically powerful Nemedians also linger, defeated remnants of an invading people now subject to their old enemies. So I am going to select Fomoria, and we're going to carry on there. So you can see Fomoria here. Fomoria, uh, you have the, the giants who once guarded the dark and stormy ocean realm of the drowned dead. With death ever near, their loyalties had changed and their malice grown. With the ascendancy of a previous Pantocrator, the omnipotent ruler god, they were punished for their sins and banished from their dark home. The full effects of the curse became evident when the Fomorians settled in a fertile land. Their offspring were short and cursed with monstrous appearance. The few surviving Fomorian giants saw their once proud race degenerate and die. Then came the invasions. Partholonians, Nemedians, Firbolg, and Tuatha all claimed the land of Fomoria. Twice the Fomorians were all but defeated by foreign magic, but twice they conjured a plague that slew the invaders. The third wave of invaders, the Firbolg, accepted Fomorian rule and aided the giants in defeating the Tuatha. Now Firbolg compose much of the Fomorian population. Fomorians are skilled shipwrights, powerful storm crafters, and have a legacy of mastery over the dead. So I have giants, Firbolg, who are basically humans, remnant Nemedians, who are powerful magical humans. Uh, I have ocean sailing, the ability to sail across water provinces, and I have units able to enter the sea. I've got several different kinds of infantry. Magic-wise, I have a lot of air magic, a lot of death magic, and a little bit of water and nature magic. You can take a look. Up here are my leaders that I can recruit to lead armies and cast spells. These are my sorcerers as well. And down here are my main combat units. So for leadership, I have Firbolg scouts who are stealthy and can scout around. I have Fomorian scouts who are also stealthy but are giants and much more expensive. There's really no reason to ever recruit them. They do have mountain and forest survival, which is nice, but so do Firbolg scouts. I have Firbolg champions. These are my basic general type unit. They have a leadership of 60, so they can lead up to 60 normal units, and they don't give any morale bonus. They can have up to two squads without inflicting a penalty. Uh, they can't lead any undead or demons, and they can't lead any magical beings. Uh, these stats I'll explain more in detail later on. They're a little complicated. Uh, I have Fomorian Champions, who are my giant leaders. Once again, they're more expensive than the Firbolg Champions, and while they're tougher, they have more hit points and more strength and all of that, not sure that's really worth the extra 20 gold and 17 resources. I have Unmarked Champions, which are a priest, so they can have a certain amount of holy magic, and they're sacred, which I'll talk about a little bit later. And then I have Firbolg Druids. These are the first of the magic users. They have nine research points a turn. Researching spells is very important in this game. Uh, they have some air magic, and then they have a random chance to have water magic, earth magic, or nature magic at a low level. So these can be effective uh, magic users to an extent. Uh, I have Fomorian Druids who have two levels of air magic and then one level of water, death, or nature. You can see how complicated the magic system is already starting to get, and we have not even dealt into it yet. I have Fom Nemidian Champions who are expensive but high leadership, give a morale bonus, can lead some undead and magic beings, and have a level of air magic and a level of death magic, plus being priests. Uh, they're stealthy and they have glamour, which makes them hard to hit in combat. And they are spell singers, which is an, a mechanic that's new to Dominions 5. Uh, where, uh, compared to normal uh, wizards, they take longer to cast spells, but they get less fatigue from it. I have Nemidian sorceresses. These are going to be my main 
bread and butter powerful spellcasters in the late game. They have a lot of undead or demonic leadership, they have two levels of air magic, two levels of death magic, and a 100% chance to have another level in air, water, death, or nature, and a 10% chance to have yet another level in air, water, death, or nature. So they have five levels of magic total, and one in ten has six. And then I have the Fomorian Kings, which are very expensive, very slow to recruit. They have three levels of air magic, two levels of death magic, and then another level of air, water, or death, plus a 10% chance of a yet another level of air, water, or death. Plus they have very high stats, they're amphibious, they can sail, they can take units with them into the ocean, and they have dark vision and all these little fun things. Troop-wise, I have human troops, I have giant troops, I have Nemedian warriors, which are very powerful magical troops, I have unmarked, which are sacred giant troops, and I have Fomorian giants, which are amphibious and huge. So, that is Fomoria. I have a couple of magic sites that I start off with. This one allows the recruitment of my special giant units and gives me some magic per turn, air gems and water gems, which you need to cast more powerful spells. And then I have a site that lets me recruit Numidians, gives me some death magic and some air magic per turn. So, starting off, I get a total of six gems per turn. Once again, I'll talk about that more in detail when I examine the magic system, which will be right about now. I have already created a pretender god for this faction, which I have, of course, named after myself. There he is, General Confu... One second, I want to... Crap. Hold, please. Okay, here we go. This is my pretender god. He is a son of the sea, which is... So, this is... The pretender god has a bunch of, a bunch of pieces. There's the chassis, the basic type of unit he is. There's the magic he has access to. Up, oh, it deleted my magic. That's what I wanted. Uh, so, the chassis, magic, his bless, which he gives to uh, sacred units, his dominion, and the effects that he has on the land. So, this game works on kind of a, what you might call a Fisher King system. The pretender, when he's around, or at, actually at all times, has these scales that affect the land he controls. Uh, so, in addition to the magic he has himself, and the bless that he gives, just having him be in charge gives me all this stuff. So this is the strength of my dominion. It governs how many sacred units I can recruit at a time, and also uh, how strong my effects are on the land that I control. Over here are my scales. Uh, this is order versus turmoil, and it controls basically how chaotic and messed up the place is. This is Productivity versus Sloth, and it mainly controls how many resources I have to build units with. Uh, heavily armored units require more resources, lightly armored units require less. Since Fomoria mainly has lightly armored units, and their units are much more expensive in gold than they are in resources, I'm willing to take some Sloth. This is Heat versus Cold. Um, basically, Heat and Cold penalize you the further away from whatever you are that you prefer. So Fomoria prefers zero heat. I've gone down to one coal to give myself a few more points at the cost of losing some income. Uh, yeah, it's basically just losing income and some supplies. I lose some supplies by doing this. Growth versus death concerns how easy it is to live and grow in your land. Having more growth gives you more income, more supplies, and uh, an increase in population growth, which governs your tax rate. Fortune versus misfortune controls how likely it is that things will be good or bad. Moving in either direction away from neutral increases the chance of random events. Misfortune decreases your luck, so makes it more likely to get bad events. And positive increases your luck, making it more, more valuable or more common to get good events. And magic, uh, for one thing, it gives you more research points per mage. For another thing, uh, magic gives you random research at the start of the game. So if you have magic scales, you'll start off with some amount of research already done. So, no, not Mananan. There we go. General Confusion. All praise General Confusion. So, these are the standard world settings. Uh, money multiple, resource multiple. This is the chance that there will be a magic site. In, or multiple magic sites in any given province, which I can search for with mages. The strength of independent garrisons. I'm going to make random events, yeah, rare, so I can kind of move quickly. Um, story events are disabled. Score graphs are disabled, so I can't see how other factions are doing unless I send a scout to go look. We've got the random start research, so 
The magic scale gives a certain amount of predetermined research. And this is the victory condition, the Thrones of Ascension. I can change the type of victory, so either I can win by beating everyone, which was the standard in Dominions 3 and before, I can win by spreading my dominion everywhere, or getting a certain score, by controlling a certain number of provinces, by completing a certain amount of research, or by doing the Thrones of Ascension. This became the standard in the previous game, Dominions 4. I can also enable basically a time limit, so after a while, a cataclysm will occur that forces someone to win. Um, so this basically limits the game, I'm not going to enable it right now. But the way Thrones of Ascension work, which is what we're going to do, is you have to get a certain number of Ascension points to win. And then you have a certain number of thrones, or special provinces on the map that have special powerful garrisons. You have to get this many points to win. A level 1 throne gives you 1 point, a level 2 gives you 2 points, a level 3 gives you 3 points. So we're going to need, we're going to say we need 5 Ascension points, we're going to have 4 level 1 thrones, and yeah, 2 level 2 thrones. So you have to capture at least half of the thrones. If you captured both the level 2s and then one level 1, you'd win. Or if you captured all the level 1s and one level 2, you'd win. Okay, I think we're ready to go. Uh, once we get into the game, I'll explain systems more in depth. Um, it's going to take a while. Not much is going to happen in this first episode. Okay, I'm going to change to renaming is allowed, so I'll be able to rename commanders. Alright, the map is created. I cut through that. It takes quite a while to start a game of Dominions, for the, the game to build the map and set all the parameters and everything. But in the beginning there was chaos. Out of chaos rose worlds populated with multitudes of beings. I'm not going to read all this. You can read it yourself, pause the video, and take a look at it. But this is basically saying, first of all, all kinds of things were happening, and then you got the Pantocrator, who came and took over everything and set everything in order. Now, uh, he's gone. He's vanished. Uh, everyone trying to worship him has found that he does not exist anymore. And now the pretender gods are breaking free and starting to rise up and fight each other. So, let's get into it. Okay, so, welcome to the world map. This is what Dominions looks like. You have the map divided into a variety of provinces by these little gray lines. Those little icons are Thrones of Ascension, so they are the provinces we have to go to. You may notice we started right next to one. Uh, I'm right here on the coast. Uh, you can see my uh, little places right here. I have Rath Chimbaith, the Isle of Balor, and then I also have a temple and a laboratory built here, as well as a fortification. All this is kind of... it's a lot to take in, but basically... This gives me the ability to recruit a bunch of my mages and special commanders and all that. It also gives me some extra defenses and the ability to gather resources from nearby into this province to help recruit units. So I start off with a uh, Firbolg scout and a Firbolg champion who has a certain number of units with him. I can recruit units here. I can look at my army setup and give my army commands before the battle. Once a battle actually starts, you can't give these units any more commands. They're just going to fight, and they will do what they do, and it'll all depend on how well you've set things up beforehand. Recruiting units over here gives me access to all my units and all my commanders, uh, and I can send my scout out to look at things. I can, I can give commands here. So, let's talk about strategy. As I said before, this nation, Fomoria, has access to a lot of air magic and a lot of death magic. I also have just a little bit of water magic available on many of my commanders. It's a random chance, but so a third of my Fomorian druids will have some water magic. Uh, a third of my Firbolg druids, druids will have some water magic. Uh, a quarter of my Nemedian sorceresses will have some water magic. And 2.5% of them, if it gets to that point, might have two levels of water magic. And of my Fomorian kings, a third will have water magic, and 3% of them might have two levels. But basically, it's air and death all the way. So, that means I need to guide my research, which is a huge part of this game, towards successful air and death magic. Because while you can recruit armies, you can have large, large armies with lots of powerful units in them. Late game, if you don't have powerful magic backing them up, you're going to fail. So, let's look at research. As you can see, because of my 
uh, my magic scale, I start with some research already done. You can go up to level 9, if I recall correctly. Yes, level 9 in all of these different schools. And they all give you different things, and they're all... There's a lot of spells, guys. There's a lot of spells. Um, the important schools for me, though, are going to be Conjuration, Evocation, and Enchantment. Uh, alteration and Construction are also going to be important, but a little bit later on. Thaumaturgy, not very important. Blood Magic, irrelevant. The Blood Magic school is different from all the others. It's only useful if you have Blood Magic, and I don't have any, and I'm not interested in it. It, it works very differently from all the others, so we're just going to ignore it. Conjuration-wise. Conjuration is valuable because I have some national summons that are pretty decent. I can summon special undead dog units. And because there are some pretty cool water summons that I can use as well. Uh, in particular, summon water power will be valuable when I am underwater because it gives me a water magic bonus. And summon yetis will be useful because I can summon these giant monkey things that throw boulders and cause cold damage. And since I have a cold aura, a cold dominion, they will be more powerful. I can summon some flying units, which will be valuable. And I have Voice of Apsu, which lets me reveal all sites of water power in one of the provinces that I own that I target with this. So a little bit of water magic will be good. Um, since I gave my pretender some water magic, he'll be able to help cast these spells and boost other people into water magic. In the short term, oh, I can also cast Dark Knowledge, which is a death spell. Uh, in this school, uh, which I will need, because it will let me get uh, Sights of Death very easily. And the Death Summons here, Black Dogs, uh, and later on the Banes and the Bane Lords and the Bar Guests will be valuable. So in the short term, I want to get Conjuration up to level 3 or 4 fairly early on. Uh, Evocation will be valuable. Oh, nope, didn't mean to do that. Evocation will be valuable to me because I have lots of air magic. And with Evocation, I can get up to Thunderstrike, which is an area of effect, very high damage lightning spell uh, that does a lot of AoE damage and basically wipes out a whole square when it hits. So Evocation level 4 will be a great place to go. Also, I can use Hurricane to drop on enemy provinces if I want. That'll be valuable. And if I boost up my water magic, I can get Freezing Mist, which does a lot of fatigue damage, which slows people down and increases the odds of them be getting hit with things and all that cool stuff. At low levels, I can also spam Lightning Bolts with my Fomorian Druids, which do a pretty decent amount of damage and ignore armor. So that's all good. Enchantment, though, is going to be my main, oddly enough, my main combat summoning school above Conjuration, because in Enchantment, I get the spells that allow me to animate the undead with my powerful death mages, so I can raise skeletons at low levels at level 3. At level 5, I get horde of skeletons, which allows me to raise a lot of skeletons at once. It does cost quite a bit of fatigue, but if I have high level death mages, level 3 or 4 or 5 death mages, I can summon a bunch of skeletons, just spam them out, and at lower fatigue cost, because having higher levels of magic than the spell requires both increases the effects of most of them and lowers the fatigue cost, which means you can cast the spell more times. So that's all really useful. I can't reanimate archers because I have no fire magic, none whatsoever. But I might eventually be able to cast Pale Riders to summon a bunch of dead cavalry as well. That's a ritual, so I would do that on the campaign map. But so my basic strategy early game is going to be to get enchantment and evocation up uh, and be able to use lightning and low-level skeleton summons to support my troops. Also, enchantment, I think it's enchantment, gives me, yes, cloud trapeze, which is an air spell that lets me teleport. It lets me teleport mages at the cost of air gems across up to five provinces. So, strategy-wise, what this means is that magically I want to get my air and death magic running, and by the mid middle of the game, so in about, uh, this game runs by turns that last a month, so 12 turns a year, by two or three years in, I want to be able to have lightning bolts and undead summons supporting my armies. So, to support that, I'm going to need to research enchantment, I'm going to need to research evocation, I'm also going to need to research construction, Unfortunately, I'm already at level 2. Construction lets you build magical items, and some of those magical items give you bonuses to your magical paths. 
Uh, in particular, air and death are a little bit hard to boost. Those items are called boosters, the ones that give you extra magic paths. So I need to get up to level 4 and then eventually level 6 construction. I won't need level 8, but I do need level 6. Um, they give you these kind of extra things along corpse man construction I'll be able to use, although it's not really very good, but could be useful. But what I really want is there's uh, the skull staff, the bag of winds, the, the winged helmet, these items that boost my air and death magic and make my air and death mages more effective. But that's all in the future. In the early game, what I mainly want to do is expand. More provinces means more money, means more income, means more mages, means more power. So I'm going to take my scout, first of all, and I'm going to move him right down here, because that's a throne of ascension, and I want to know if it's too tough to take early game. Uh, my pretender, once he comes out, will be a very valuable asset. However, in order to get more points, to give him scales and magic, I set him to only arrive about a year into the game. So I have about 12 turns to go before he comes up. This guy, I'm going to make my profit. When I make someone my profit, you can only ever have one, it automatically makes him a powerful holy wizard. Uh, so he can cast certain specific holy spells that don't cost fatigue, and he can just spam them out. They can be quite useful. Mainly, the main benefit of it is he gets to cast Blessing, uh, which blesses all of your sacred units and gives them a specific effect, depending on... Um, what your bless is. So Fomorian kings with their high air and death magic are sacred and can be blessed. Fomorian druids are sacred and can be blessed. Uh, also, these unmarked are sacred and can be blessed. So I have sacred commanders and I have sacred units. Uh, my bless, the bless that I chose was, uh, well, you'll get to see it in combat sometime soon. So I have fairly low resources here. Uh, fortunately, I have some low resource support units as well as the unmarked. So I'm going to recruit, well, I have two low resources to really recruit any unmarked right at the moment. So I'm just going to go with Fairbold Warriors, I think. Uh, average stats for a human are pretty much 10 across the board. So Fairbold Warriors have high magic resistance, good morale, good stats, but low protection. They don't have much armor. So, defense skill 14, defense skill 15. So I am going to recruit the Fearbold Warriors with Spears. I'm gonna get four of them and a bunch of Slingers to back them up. Fearbold Slingers are not bad. They don't do a whole lot of damage, uh, but they have pretty good range and a decent amount of ammunition and okay precision. Not great, but okay. Precision controls how ranged attacks scatter. Um, it's also really valuable for mages because it controls how spells scatter. Fomorian Druids unfortunately have low precision, but Part of my bless that I got is a big boost to precision, and precision points over 10, there's a complicated formula, but as your precision goes over 10, even by a few points, it becomes astronomically better, ex exponentially better. So I think my bless should buff, buff my Fomorian Druids up to precision 13, which will make them quite good at throwing lightning bolts. Uh, Numidian Sorceresses are already precision 12, and with air magic they can buff that even further. Anyway. So I've got 271 gold still left. I'm going to start recruiting Fairbolg Druids. They're not the most powerful, but they get nine research points and they're cheap. So for early game research monkeys, they're very, very good. The Fomorian Druids get more research points, but cost a lot more gold and more to maintain. So I don't want them just yet. My mages are not going into combat at this point. So I'm just gonna set that to repeat recruitment, recruit that every turn and I think we are going to end our turn, because I think that's all we want to do. This is my uh, defense page. You can see I have 25 points of defense here. You buy defense in provinces with gold, and this gives me all these free units to defend this province. So if anybody attacks me, all these units will pop up on the battlefield and fight them. Uh, up here, you can see the money I'm making from this province, the number of resources it has, the number of recruitment points, which control how many units I can recruit. I have 234 for units and two for commanders. Uh, the commander points are a new a new thing in Dominions 5, new from Dominions 4. And they control, they limit how many commanders you can recruit in a turn. So you can see here, Firbolg Druid costs 2, but the Fomorian King costs 4, so he takes 2 turns. By contrast, the Firbolg Champion only takes 1, the Firbolg Scout only takes 1, and the Fomorian Scout only takes 1... Morian Champion only takes one, and the Unmarked Champion only takes one. So basically, all the non-spellcasters only take one, which means if I want to, if I don't want a spellcaster, instead I can recruit two scouts, 
or two standard commanders in a turn. But I do want a spellcaster, so I'm going to recruit one. Um, supplies govern whether or not your troops are starving. You can see over here I have 986 supplies, of which I'm using 32 for the units in the province. And the population controls how much money you get, uh, because you tax the population at a certain rate. Then it gives you more resources and more income the more population you have. So, let's end the turn. Okay, proclamation from Fomoria. I've made my Furbolg champion a prophet. So now, I, I you can see I waited one turn before expanding, and that's so that I could see what's around me. It takes one turn after the start of the game to see units in adjacent provinces. And if you don't have a scout there, your information is of relatively low quality. So you see about 20 units, mainly militias, archers, and heavy infantry. That doesn't mean that something else might not be there. It only gives me the most common units. Down here, since I have a scout in here, this information will be better, although still not 100% accurate. They have about 60 units, mainly barbarians. That means they're not going to have spellcasters, but barbarians are very dangerous. So this is probably a level 1, uh, a level 1 throne, because it's not very well defended. Let's go to army setup. So I've got some spears to mix in there and some slingers in there. I'm just putting them in the already assigned groups. Fogartak, since he is now the prophet, he can cast spells. Uh, I don't have any sacred units that can be blessed at the moment, except for the prophet himself, who is always blessed. And you can see the effects of my bless here. Morale 1, precision plus 4, and I believe there was a death blessing too, wasn't there? There should have been a death aspect to the blessing because my pretender had death magic. Well, I... Oh, no! No, that's right. It only matters when he's incarnate. So that'll come up later in the game. There was a a, a death aspect to the blessing that I got, but it, it will only happen when my pretender is actually on the field. So you can see his precision is really buffed up by that bless. He doesn't have any sacred units, though, so he doesn't need to worry about blessing. Instead, he can cast the Syllable of Death, since my Pretender is mainly a Death Mage, which uh, just straight up kills somebody, and if they survive it by using their magic resistance, they still get fatigued. So, you just cast Syllable of Death a whole bunch of times. Uh, you can cast Holy Avenger. Yeah, that's not important. Yep, just cast Syllable of Death and cast Spells. Sy Syllable of Death has infinite range. So I'm going to put my melee troops up front. I'm going to put my slingers behind them. They are going to uh, fire. You are going to attack the closest enemy. And so now I have some an easy province right there, an easy province right there with Ichthyids, who are amphibious. Uh, I'm going to hit this province first. I don't want to hit this yet because it has all these barbarians. And recruitment-wise, I still don't have many resources, so I'm going to stick to recruiting. Um, yes, I'm going to stick to recruiting Firbolg for now. And those will be my expansion parties for the start of the game. I've got one Firbolg druid who is now doing research, so now I should actually set up a research queue. So I'm going to start with, I already have two, two levels of construction, a level of Thaumaturgy, which is pretty unimportant. Uh, it does give me Frighten, which is kind of nice, but overall this will be fairly unimportant to me. Auspex will be a decent spell because it lets me get knowledge of air sites, but I'll have enough air mages I can just search for them manually. Uh, so let's get, let's research level 2 evocation for lightning bolt first. So you can see I can just queue these up and they'll automatically be gone through. And then let's get conjuration level... Hmm. Let's get conjuration level 4, I think. So we're going to have two levels of evocation. Level 3 doesn't really give me anything level 4 does, though. Yeah, so this spell also I'm going to definitely want, because this spell, if there's a storm going on, this gives my air, ma my air mages an air magic bonus when I cast it. However, it only works during a storm. In order to get a storm, I need to cast the spell Storm at level 5, and I need to have a level 4 air mage on the battlefield already. So, I need evocation level 5 before 
summon storm power will really do me much good. So I'm going to get evocation. Uh, let's add, yeah, let's get it up to level two first, and then we will hit uh, enchantment. No, enchantment is mainly useful for death. So you can see the um, see how I only see the air spells because I pressed A on this screen. I can also press D to see all the death spells. Uh, raise dead and raise skeletons are the spells that I want early on. So yeah, I want enchantment level three once I have evocation level two, I think. But I also want conjuration for um, enchantment will be later on spamming the skeletons out. So let's first get conjuration up to level four. Okay, so that's my research set up, and so I think this is going to be my first actual combat turn. Let's get in a battle before we uh, before we end this video, which I am going to have to do pretty shortly. But let's at least get in the battle. We've talked about the basic strategy. We've talked about the way this nation is set up. Let's get in a fight. Oh, my Furbolg scout is doing nothing. Uh, yeah, I want him to move. He can move over there and uh, take a look at Falgoth. Okay, so there was a battle in Vulcan. Let's go view it. Okay, so to pause first, this is the battle screen. You see, um, you get the two armies lined up across from each other, and you go into it. So they have some standard commanders. They have some archers with short bows, which are not very impressive. They've got some heavy infantry, uh, which have heavy armor. And they also have some militia, which suck. Low stats, low protection, low morale. They do have three commanders. So a battle is one. You can rout the enemy either by killing enough of them that they all break and run, or by killing all of the commanders. Killing all of the commanders is very hard in the early game, becomes easier as you go along. So we're going to throw some sling stones at him. Not doing much damage. Uh, you can see my Firbolg absolutely outclass these, uh, these little independent infantry. So Fog Attack is now casting Sermon of Courage, which is boosting my morale a little bit, keep everybody in the fight. My slingers are hurling rocks at the archers, not really accomplishing a whole lot. Well, they do some damage. And the Furbolg come in and clean up. The independent armies are routed, and the battle is over. So, we can then look at a um, overall stat thing here, a stat page that gives me the number of kills that we accomplished and the number of deaths that we suffered. We suffered zero deaths, because Furbolg are quite good, and we killed all of the enemy. So, we have now captured Vokan. That's how battles in Dominions 5 go. Once again, you don't have any input into how the battle goes after you have set it up. You just set it up, and you let your units go. And they will do all the fighting for you. Uh, also of note, you can see this little bright outline. That is how far my Dominion has spread. The number of candles right up here are how powerful my Dominion is. And these right here are my scales, and they will spread along with the Dominion. So you can see over here, I have two Sloth, two Growth, and two Magic. Whereas over here, where my Dominion isn't really effective yet, I only have two Growth and one Magic and one Heat, despite the fact that my Dominion is one of Cold, because it is early summer, which is a hot time of year. Heat and Cold vary worldwide with the seasons. So, we've captured a province. Uh, we've got a couple of mages researching. Our research is going pretty along at a pretty good clip, 22 research points a month because of our plus two per mage bonus. So I've got air and nature there. I've got air and earth there. So these ones give me little splashes of other magics, which can be useful. Um, I should finish up evocation in just a couple of turns, the first level. Uh, and my little expansion army, which has suffered no casualties, can keep on trucking. Falgoth down here would be fairly easy to take. It's all militia and heavy infantry. Unfortunately, it's not going to be terribly useful. It might give me a little bit of income, but mountains don't have much income. But it might have some magic sites. Um, I don't really want to go there first, though, because uh, it will slow my expansion in the future, because I'll have to back out of it and waste a turn moving through my own territory. So instead, I'm going to move up here and take out these Ichthyids. I'm recruiting some more units in the army here. So at some point, uh, I'm going to want to let's get another Fairbold Warrior while we're at it. Since I got some more resources, because since I have a fort here, some resources get taken from every adjacent province that I own and shipped back here to the fort. So forts help you concentrate resources to build units more quickly. So now I have 65 resources instead of 55, because I'm taking 10 from Vokan. 
Um, I'm gonna recruit for another turn or two here, and then I'm gonna, I'm gonna get one more Fairbolg Druid, and then I'll probably get a Scout and a Champion to lead the next army. Maybe even an unmarked Champion, because he will give me a morale bonus. That could be pretty good. Yeah, I think I might do that. Okay, next turn. Oh, my Furbolg Scout's still doing nothing because he's a lazy, useless piece of work. Um, you can see here I can give multi-turn movement paths, which is pretty neat. Okay, we got a couple of unexpected events. There was a battle, but let's look at these first. So, first of all, the lands around the throne of winter are growing increasingly cold. Ah, so that tells me what that throne is. That throne down here, this is the throne of winter. So you can see the snow effect. Um... These provinces are snowy now, which makes movement a little bit harder. Uh, and there was a battle in Queen Forest. Let's see how it went. See if I took any losses. Against Ichthyids, I doubt I did. So Ichthyids are fish people. There are standard Ichthyids, which have crap stats and crap magic resistance and all that, but pretty decent morale. Uh, and they have nets, which can web people in. Uh, once per battle, they can stick somebody down so they can't move or defend themselves very well. And then there are Ichthyid Warriors, which are basically just Ichthyids that are wearing armor, and so have a decent protection value. Protection subtracts, subtracts from damage, defense stops you from getting hit at all. But, stat-wise, they're so bad that my troops should win fairly easily. It looks like I lost somebody there and somebody got netted. The Ichthyid Warriors are- uh-oh, the Ichthyid Warriors are heading for the back lines. They're going after the slingers, and my warriors are busy. That was a, uh, that was a death. So the Ichthyid warriors have reached the slingers. However, the slingers are actually defending themselves okay in melee. Not great, but okay. And now the Ichthyid warriors are surrounded, and as a consequence, their morale is breaking. You can see here, his morale is red. That means he's routing, because he had to make a morale check, and he failed it. So, uh, that's the end of that. I'm just going to speed through the rest of that, and they're all dead. Great. I did lose some units. I lost three Fairbolg Slingers and four Fairbolg Warriors, so my little expansion party here is suffering some attrition. But I've now captured this forest, which is more resources, so now Fomoria is up to 81 resources. So I can stop recruiting Druids for just one turn. I'm going to get another Scout and an Unmarked Champion. Uh, that will cut down on my resources that are available, so next turn I'll only be able to recruit four Fairbolg Warriors. But so he'll have an army of about 25 to lead. Actually, at this point, I may want to shift over to recruiting unmarked, since they can be blessed. Actually, not yet. Later in the game, I'll want unmarked. But right now, since my bless is a late game bless that won't be relevant until the, uh, the end of the first year, I don't particularly want them. I could recruit Fomorians which are stronger, but their stats overall are actually not quite as good. Uh, they have a lot more hit points, and that's about all they have going for them. And resource-wise, the decent ones cost more. Fomorian Warriors here cost 27 resources, whereas Furbolg Warriors only cost 10. I could also get Nemidians, which are very, very good and also very, very well defended because they have glamour and high stats. But once again, high resource cost, high gold cost. Um, not necessarily all that worth it. So over here, Militia and Archers, this province has heavy cavalry, which are very, very dangerous, so I'm not sure I want to go in on them just yet. But anyway, I actually need to cut this episode here, so we will continue this next time. We started off expansion at a reasonably decent clip. Um, hopefully we won't be slowing down anytime soon. Uh, we are going to basically try to just take as many of these provinces as we can, as quickly as we can. About 110 units. Okay, so there's a significant horde of barbarians there. That might have to wait till late game, because barbarians have a lot of damage. Or, well, the mid game, at least. Um, this province is going to be a roadblock. This province is going to be a bit of a roadblock that we'll have to concentrate some force to take out. And then we'll move this way into the woods, which give us good resources. And uh, we will see if we can spin up some magic pretty soon. By by the end of the first year, or the second year at latest, I'd like to be sending out uh, some Fomorian Druids with Lightning Bolt spamming ability to support my armies with Lightning Bolts. But in any case, thank you all so much for watching this. I, I know this game is slow and old looking and doesn't have the best graphics, 
but I love it. Uh, the strategy is very, very deep and very, very complex. The fact that you have to set your army up before the battle starts and you can't affect what they do once they've gotten into the battle makes for some very interesting battle strategies. Uh, the magic system is extremely deep. You can see there's just hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of spells available, all of which do different things. Um, battle spells, rituals, summoning spells, it's it's, it's crazy, it's insane. It, 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 it's the biggest game this side of Dwarf Fortress, and I love it to death for how deep it is. But anyway, enough of talking and making you listen to me ramble. Thank you all so much for watching. Uh, if you liked more of this, tune in. I will be playing this series more. I don't know if I'll finish the game, because that might take a long time. But honestly, I probably will, because like I said, I really like this game. So, uh, thank you all once again, and I'll see you in the next one.